Welcome to Harbinger's flagship interactive webinar, Power Hour. Select the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker from audio settings. If necessary, join the webinar using your phone. Use the queue and a panel to share your questions. This webinar is being recorded. Attendees will receive the recording. Let's tune in. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this Power Hour today. Uh, Power Hour is an industry experts roundtable presented to you by Harbinger. Today, we are going to talk about a very insightful topic. Uh, you know, we are going to talk about how we can leverage AI enabled virtual tutor to enhance the learner experience. So, you know, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to everyone who has joined us from the different parts of the world. Uh, my name is Rahul Rahul Singh. I'm the Senior Director at EdTech. I represent Harbinger Group, and I will be the host for today's uh, panel discussion. I hope everyone can see the video and the audio is clear. If someone has is facing any issues, please feel free to type in the chat box, and we'll help you resolve that. So with that, what's our game plan for today? What are we going to discuss today? So primarily, I think uh, we'll be talking about the need, opportunities, and future of AI-enabled virtual tutor. Then we will look upon how AI-based virtual tutors can be designed, customized, deployed, and integrated. Then moving on, how AI-enabled virtual tutors can provide personalized learning experience to learners. And lastly, we are going to talk about how this transformative technology of generative AI and LLMs, which is basically large language models, how they can be used for implementing an AI-enabled tutor. And we would certainly like to have this as a very interactive uh, uh, panel discussion. Of course, we'll welcome our panelists in a moment from now. But uh, you know, at any point of time, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we will kind of make sure that we include that in our conversation. So with that, let me um, introduce you to our first panelist for the today. We have Paul with us. Paul is co-founder at Cognify Learning Company. So good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, panel discussion today. Thank you so much for having me, Raul. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, to, to discuss this important uh, technological advancement. So Paul, uh, for the audience benefit, if you could please talk a little bit about yourself and uh, your organization, who you are, what you do. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so we are a education technology company based here in beautiful Austin, Texas. And uh, so what we do is we provide uh, fine-tuned course-specific AI models to students here at UT and hopefully hopefully going to scale it up nationally. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, our models are trained on, you know, very unique data sets to provide, you know, things like chapter summaries, practice problems, et cetera, on a 24 seven basis to um, students of all different types of classes. Right, thank you, thank you, Paul. And, uh, you know, uh, after this, uh, <clears throat> sorry, once we move into this discussion ahead, uh, we will definitely kind of uh, have uh, specific questions and we will take a little bit of deep dive into what you're doing because it sounds like, you know, what we are going to uh, talk today and what you are doing has, uh, you know, quite some overlap and synergy. So it will be very interesting to get your thoughts on that aspect. So once again, thank you very much for, uh, you know, uh, joining us for this conversation and we look forward to it. Of course. And with that, uh, let me uh, welcome our second panelist for the day. We have Kim joining us. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, on Mars, I think it might be mid-morning. I'm not sure. <laughs> right. So, Kim, thank you once again for joining us for this discussion. So, Absolutely. You know, just for the audience benefit, if you could talk a little bit about yourself as to what you have been doing in the AI space, the learning space, that would be beneficial. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to put my, and Paul, you should do the same, your LinkedIn in the chat 
box here. Uh, it's the best way, I think, for us to get to know each other professionally. I come from a very eclectic background, and uh, a couple of years ago, I founded EdTech Research Labs because it became to be very, um, very important to me to acknowledge that the world, especially an AI augmented world, has changed significantly and our education models haven't actually since the late 1800s. And so EdTech Research Labs is focused exclusively on re-engineering a couple of things, not just the education system itself, but I believe it's time for us to actually redefine what it means to be educated. And that implies uh, a number of societal uh, issues and questions that uh, we just need to wrestle with because the 21st century is here. No, uh, that, that that truly makes sense, Kim. I think uh, it's very interesting that, you know, even though we are talking about an advanced technology like generative AI and its usage and leveraging it for enhanced learning experience, but I think uh, this point that you made is uh, the technology has been evolving quite rapidly and quite disruptively, but the education model has not changed and primarily for the last, you know, maybe one century or a couple of centuries. Right. And so it looks like we are at that intersection where the technology and the society have to embrace each other, adapt to each other, make changes, and then you know collectively move forward for the betterment of the uh, overall society and you know learners for that say in our context. Right. So we'll move ahead in the conversation. So basically. Uh, this is a quote from Satya Nadella. So today we are talking about AI-based virtual tutors. This doesn't primarily mean means that we are talking about replacing uh, tutors by a technology like an AI-enabled virtual tutor. I think I will uh, bring your attention to the second paragraph that Satya Nadella, the CEO at Microsoft says, is that rather than worry about machines taking over human jobs, one perspective to look at it is AI will transform jobs and the economy, creating new opportunities and prosperity. And if we look at it from our lens, you know, we, we, we are talking about the teaching faculties, the tutors, uh, and the educators. It's like, I know uh, all of us have kind of read these articles or have a fair idea that, you know, I think one of the McKenzie reports said that, you know, probably close to 50%, a little less than 50% of the time of an educator goes in performing mundane tasks, which are not directly related to teaching and educating and all. So let's look at it from a perspective that, you know, this AI enabled virtual tutor can free up some of your time, which you're spending in doing mundane activities. And that time you can focus on improving uh, the learner engagement, the learner experience by leveraging this AI enabled virtual tutor. And the other aspect is it's it's no hidden fact that you know AI is disrupting uh, industries across the globe, across domains, but specifically in the education market. And that too, if we look in the North America segment, uh, this this segment, the AI in education market is expected to grow from approximately two billion in 2022 to more than 25 billion in 2030. I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, you know, it's kind of a major disruption. And this is a data which uh, was published six months back. And I would not be surprised if the, this data has changed and that 25 billion has further increased a few notches there. So that's kind of, uh, you know, talking about the need and all. And the other aspect is what we are trying to address over here or bring to our attention is, like when COVID hit, the pandemic hit, you know, it just disrupted the education industry. Uh, to a very significant uh, percentage. And after that, I think all of us would have read, heard this news that there's a, you know, there's this burnout syndrome happening in the teaching teacher fraternity. And it is all because, you know, people were overworked trying to deal with certain technologies which they have never used in the past and trying to cope up with the demands of the learners in a hybrid or, a, you know, totally remote learning environment. So there are these, some stats, American Educational Research Association, it says that teachers in the US are 40% more likely to experience symptoms of anxiety 
in comparisons with workers from other industries like healthcare. Now we all know that you know during pandemic and after pandemic and in the current situation of US, healthcare industry is one of the industries which is under maximum strain. So there's a huge population which is retiring out. There's new skilled workforce that needs to come in and replace them. And the healthcare needs have risen so much. So the education is, you know, the uh, education industry is kind of beating them in by 40% in terms of being strainful. So that's one stat definitely, which kind of captures our attention. Now, you know, 74% of the teachers said they had to take up extra duties to cover the staff shortages. So because a lot of people quit, because of this burnout syndrome, a lot of people quit their teaching jobs, which means the folks who were left in the system, they had to take up additional roles and responsibilities. In fact, 80% teachers reported that they had to, you know, do more work than, than their expected roles and responsibilities. So that was again further causing or adding to the burnout. And there's another stat that says that female teachers are especially affected with 55% experiencing burnout compared to 44% of male teachers. And that could be of various reasons, various roles, responsibilities, etc. So I think uh, from a context perspective, uh, this is what we wanted to kind of uh, bring to your attention. And now this particular slide is uh, what we are trying to say over here is AI enable virtual tutor. What are some of the key things that it can do? Of course, it can you know make the learning experiences personalized based on the learner's choices. Twenty four by seven availability. You don't have to rely on a teacher to you know the specific window in which a tutor or a teacher is available. Instant feedback, uh, tracking progress. You know, giving you instant feedback and tracking progress and letting you know where you are in your journey of completing a learning path or completing a goal. But these are just a few ones. I would you know, encourage uh, the audience to type in in the chat box and share what are some of the other things that you feel an AI-enabled virtual tutor can bring into the system when we are talking about learner experience. So please feel free to kind of type in uh, your thoughts in the chat box. And also, if you you know, kind of at this stage, if you have any questions, please go ahead and shoot them for us. Now, I think this is a good segue for me to kind of uh, invite our panelists and have their expert opinions on some of the pointed questions that we have for today. So Kim, the first one, uh, we would request you to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, share your thoughts on this one. So generally from your perspective, what do you feel are the most pertinent needs for an AI-enabled virtual tutor? Well, certainly, but uh, I wanted to make a quick comment about your introduction. Uh, you commented about uh, teacher burnout and a fear that teachers might be replaced. And let me uh, reaffirm from my view, from our view, that uh, we are moving into a society that's going to require even more educators. But we need educators that are in education and learning and training fields because they wanted to enthuse or excite or inspire or lead or motivate uh, individuals into becoming the best that they can be. And what we've seen with the current education model is unfortunately there's a lot of administrivia that is occupying too much of their day. And so I wanted to echo your sentiment that the AI is beautifully designed to take on heavy lifting. And I look forward to a society where teachers and educators are refocused on what it is that we do well as humans to humans. We excite each other. We get each other just motivated as heck to learn something new. So with that said, uh, I believe that an AI-enabled tutor, primary aspects are, A, it needs to be personalized. But we also need to acknowledge that data goes two ways. So it's not just the AI tutor responding to the learner's needs. It's the learner's needs demanding from the AI and the human educator that's out there somewhere. We need to identify how we're going to implement this technology. And you said something to the effect a moment ago about uh, 24 AI is available 24-7. I'm also adamantly convinced that education and learning is a 24-7 endeavor. 
So we need to wrap our minds around what does education begin to look like as we move forward. And in that simple little sentence, I've called into question the whole idea of student progress, uh, accreditation, grading, timelines, everything. I want to encourage this audience in the education and training field is suspect. Simply because we've done it that way for the last 200 years doesn't mean that we need to do it moving forward. And the analogy I'll give you very quickly is in many ways, I see AI being strapped on to the existing education system, much akin to strapping a rocket engine on a horse and buggy and expecting to see any positive results. It, 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 we can't do that. So uh, hopefully I've answered that question. Oh, absolutely, Tim, and, and thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your insights there. I'll, I'll just read out uh, a couple of comments from our audience. So Seamus says that conducting research is one as a need for an AI-enabled virtual tutor. Uh, and then Deepashri says AI-enabled tutors will bring in unbiased assessment and feedback. So uh, those are the two comments from audience. And, uh, yeah, and, and let's talk about research just very briefly um, in the interest of time. We only have an hour. We could talk about this for days, right? Uh, you know, so let's talk about research that has occurred and research that needs to occur. But uh, Benjamin Bloom, which I hope most folks that are in the education and training market uh, recognize that name, he had involved a, a number of uh, research uh, mechanisms in the educational sector for years. Uh, had a study, he and his team called it the Two Sigma Problem. And what he identified, this is back in the 80s, is that personalized learning, personalized tutors, and a complete disregard for timelines and grades, tracking the learner towards mastery was more effective up to Two Sigma uh, indifference, which is a significant statistical improvement. But the reason they called it a problem is because at that time, it was not economically feasible to dedicate a tutor to each and every student. Flash forward to today, we've got AI tutors, and yes, we can. So we can go back and revisit some of the problems that were identified even 40 and 50 years ago, because we finally have the technology to be able to attend to those things. And then research moving forward one of the projects that we're working on is uh, what we call JITE, which is just-in-time education. We're modeling what that might look like as we move forward because the AI can be smart enough to identify when a learner is bumping into trouble and intervene. And so what does that model look like? And that's kind of what we're wrapping on our minds around now. And that's going to require some additional research as well. Right. Well, thank you very much for elaborating on that aspect uh, on the research part, Kim. And I think uh, uh, this is like every time I speak to you, I have a conversation with you. There's uh, at least two or three things new that I learned from you. So this, uh, the Bloom's uh, thing, the two sigma problem that you just mentioned. Of course, I was aware of Bloom's taxonomy coming from the e-learning background. But uh, the way you describe this two sigma problem is something new that I've learned today. And thank I you. encourage everybody to look it up. It's a very interesting study. Uh, absolutely. And I think uh, the point that you made is, uh, you know, just in time education and is AI smart enough to figure out the, you know, subtle nuances where the learner is getting trapped and all. I think that's a question that we will kind of divert to Paul moving ahead in the conversation. Because, you know, it's not that, that you know, AI-enabled tutors have not been there. People have been using it for quite some time. But, you know, in today's context, we are more or less talking about the next-gen AI-enabled virtual tutors and, you know, how, how we can do that. So we'll come to that later. Uh, so, Paul, uh, you know, this one is for you. Like, you know, we wanted to know your thoughts in terms of uh, how do you foresee the future of an AI-enabled virtual tutor as we keep moving ahead? Uh, yes, I, I kind of want to uh, echo uh, you know Kim's statement about uh, the, the the two sigma problem that he mentioned. I think that uh, it's very th that was not economically feasible uh, having a tutor a specified tutor for every single student uh, in the world. That was not economically feasible in 1984. Uh, that's that's when that study was was conducted, and that's when it was determined to not be economically feasible. 
Now, fast forward to today, we have models that are not only able to respond based off of uh, pre-trained data, but also able to respond off of data that they didn't have before. They're mm -hmm. able to conclude certain, um, they're able to come to some conclusions that they were not trained on before is something called zero shot prompting. So the fact that that technology exists is very interesting. And the way that I foresee the future of, uh, of a virtual tutor is right now, I, I, I do think that, you know, Kim and I, I know that we're, we're going to go into this a little bit later, but I do see that, I do think that we see the, the long-term future of education uh, the same way, which is that, you know, it's, it's possible that, that we move away from a, you know, teacher to many um, model and move to a more personalized approach where that is a, like a personalized one-on-one -on -one approach is the main driver of education. But in my opinion, the way that we do that, the way that we work on that future today is by having these course specific AI models that are able to, that are trained on you know, class specific data and are able to do things that, that a tutor can do, but on a 24 seven basis. Um, and one, one last thing I want to mention is in terms of the short-term future, I see three different sectors in the current pedagogical ecosystem, which is you have traditional lecture, you have office hours, and then you have uh, in-person tutoring. Now, going off of what Kim just mentioned, there is no 24 seven availability. There is no on-demand, just-in-time uh, education. And that's exactly what, what our team here at Cognify is, is trying to um, uh, curate. So with our models, you have that perfect fit of 24 seven on-demand learning that fits into the ped uh, pedagogical ecosystem right now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, you made a very valid point there that, you know, uh, the data availability, I mean, the amount of data that is available these days is just humongous. And I heard someone saying like, you know, maybe five to six years back in a conference that data is the new oil. Uh, like, you know, people were uh, kind of, uh, the developed economies were based around this oil industry and, you know, uh, this crude oil and other things. And nowadays data is the new kind of thing. So of course, when we kind of talk about the implementation of a AI enabled virtual tutor, we'll uh, you know kind of pick your brains on that. You how do we make sense of that data? And I think uh, that's that's uh, uh, we'll we'll come to you with that question later. So uh, now moving to Kim is that uh, Kim? Uh, we spoke about these uh, personalized uh, learning experience. So you know if you could just give some of share some of your thoughts or give some examples in terms of what are those some of the things that we can do and generally what do we typically mean by personalized learning experience i think uh, in the good old days typically adaptive learning was something which people used to position as personalized learning but in the current context of things the definition of personalized learning has evolved to a certain extent so if you could just share some of your thoughts in terms of what does it mean. Sure, and I'll glue those two together because I still use the ALT, Adaptive Learning uh, Technology uh, acronym. <laughs> really what we're saying is that ALT was a good start, but now we're augmenting it with an AI. So it's AI augmented adaptive learning technology. Uh, so what calls into question then is what do we mean by a personalized in learning environment to echo your question? What, what educators are beginning to suspect is that we might be able to, and once again, we need to do some basic uh, research in which we can have uh, characteristic numbers to deal with. Uh, you know, if you want to return to the Socratic ideal of the individual driving through their curiosity, through discourse, identification of ways for them to improve themselves. You know, that's a lot of words, right? But that's really the crux of learning. Then you end up with a personalized learning environment that isn't just providing content that you expect that individual learner to regurgitate, because that's what we've been doing for the last 200 years and see where we've gotten to. But what happens is the learner begins driving their own education model based on curiosity and exploration. And so to uh, 
repeat what Paul had mentioned, rather than a one teacher, many, many students model, we have one learner, many, many teachers. And some of those teachers are human and some of those teachers are AI. So to encapsulate, personalized learning has nothing to do with the group. Personalized learning has to do with that individual's success. And one of the things that I always state is when someone says that they failed the class, I know for a fact that it wasn't them that failed. It was the educational model that failed them. I don't believe in failed students. I don't believe in them. There's maybe some reasons in which they're not being successful. Fix those reasons. But the whole idea of failure, I think, is something we, we need to start throwing out the window when it comes to education. And that's the crux of personalized education. Everyone's a success or can be. This, this is a wonderful perspective. And I, I can just feel it that this is coming from, uh, you know, right from the heart of an individual who strongly believes in the education model and the advancement of the education model. I think the point that you mentioned is, you know, shifting the tables, like, you know, instead of, uh, you know, one teacher, many students to one student, many teachers, that that's, that's a very interesting uh, uh, take on this particular situation and scenario. So uh, we'll just uh, take a look at the Q&A and the chat box. Let's see if we are, you know, getting something. So I think there's a comment which says that to paraphrase a bit, education is not the filling of a pail, but the igniting of ideas. So oh, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, Carl Sagan had a lot to do, a lot to say about his disappointment in dealing with small children in kindergarten, one through second, third grade, and how curious they were, how excited they were about the world, and all of the questions that were just bubbling out of them. And then he would go present in front of a group of high schoolers or even undergraduates and realize how quickly all of that curiosity had been beat out of them. And so the current model is not good at facilitating this kind of a sentiment that it's the igniting of ideas. What if? Why can't we? Uh, we we suddenly are walking in. I, I tell people I love the 21st century. I can't wait till the 24th. Uh, but we're walking into a century in which we're going to have all these glorious tools at our fingertips, and we can't use them the same way that we've used tools that have gotten us here. We don't need steam engines anymore. We need sales, I suppose. But anyway, I don't know if I answered that or not, but I, I'll i get off my soapbox. <laughs> Actually, one of the words that you used uh, in your response, sentiment, and I think uh, Paul and Kim... Uh, the next, the, one of the questions that we have from our audience is uh, kind of right to the sentiment part, because end of the day, teaching is, you know, kind of an emotion, uh, human to human connect and all those things. So Absolutely. to be honest, I was expecting this answer, but I was expecting this, this uh, sorry, this question, but I was expecting this more towards the end of our discussion. It has come up, you know right at midway and probably this is a good time. Thank you for asking this question. So I'll just read out the question and if you can share your thoughts on this. Uh, can you speak about the efficacy of the tutoring from an AI teaching assistant? Example, how can it match the personalized nature of an instructor or tutor who knows the student and understands the assignment? Yeah, I think, oh, if, can you throw it out? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm going to formulate my answer, okay. so go ahead. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, for, for from my perspective, a little bit of background on us before we get into like the details of the question. Uh, it's important to note that for, for our company in particular, we we started off as a as a person-to-person -person tutoring company first. Uh, that, that was uh, one of the predecessors of Cognify that we started uh, about two and a half years ago was largely person-to-person -person because of that question right there. There is an authenticity and there is a need to have uh, a person to person learning environment. There's no question about that. I mean, we could, we can train our models as much as we want to, to mimic that type of um, condition. But at the end of the day, there's going to be something missing because at the end, like, we're all, we're all human. Uh, so we start off in that realm, but with an AI subservice, 
but thankfully, like because of the demand for our uh, our AI uh, capabilities, we've transitioned. But we still want to keep that person to person approach because you cannot beat that. There needs to be a hybrid approach to this environment, which is kind of exactly what what Kim has alluded to, where we have you know in person uh, experiences such as a uh, um, a ma- an overall master of the of the, of the content that that is able to oversee the performance of all students. But in terms of the twenty four seven on demand support. That would be from from an expert in the material through an AI, but I do think that as we progress in this technology, we can't we, we need to have some sort of uh, hybrid uh, approach because we don't want to lose it out on that motivational human aspect. No question about it. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. We we need to recognize that the human to human compassion component is critical, absolutely critical. And as I had mentioned earlier, from my view, most learner, uh, most teachers, most educators are in that line of work. And face it, we all felt that spark whenever we're helping someone learn something new is that that excitement when you see the lights go on in their eyes. Right. That That's a human to human response. But I'll add to that. I've been doing a lot of research on understanding why there is such a high failure rate with Algebra 1 students at freshman level in higher ed. And what we're beginning to discover is, and no surprise, right? I'm going to be talking to the, the anybody that's had trouble with algebra here is going to understand exactly what I'm saying. Some people understand it conceptually very quickly. Other people understand it eventually, and it could take them months, it could take them years. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who cares? So if you have the human element there, that's providing enthusiasm and some guidance and some overview, particularly a topic like algebra, and then you've got an AI system that is doing the heavy lifting and helping that individual learn algebra over the course of however long it takes them. I think you've married the best of the human enterprise and the AI em- enterprise together in an educational model. That, that's my vision on that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Kim. And kind of... Uh... I can't hold myself uh, back in asking this question or bringing up this on the forum for discussion is that when we were talking about traditional AI, you know, the pre-chat GPT era. So in my mind, it's the pre-chat GPT era and the post-chat GPT era in AI. So in the pre-chat GPT era, the uh, natural language processing models that we had, you know, it had reached to an extent wherein they could do a sentiment and intent analysis as well. For example, while interacting with the students and the way they are writing, or if it's voice enabled, the way they are speaking, they could read between the lines and words and figure out is this student under stress, distressed, is kind of will drop out, not be able to complete the course, those kind of things. So is that still relevant? And is that the sentiment and intent analysis, if we can bring in the post chat GPT era as well, can that bridge some of that gap between the AI tutor versus the actual human tutor? Absolutely. Uh, what And I mentioned this earlier, uh, data just doesn't go one way. It goes multiple ways, right? And so uh, what we can build are AIs that are very sensitive to the performance of that individual learner and then develop flag models. Uh, we have a student here that can't comprehend this particular concept. Or gosh forbid, we have a student here that seems to be in emotional duress that has nothing to do with this class. We can build those flags. Now, we could have yet another session on the whole idea of privacy and security. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to get into that. That, that's a can of worms that I don't think anybody's going to like I, what I have to say about it. Uh, but I, I think what we're going to discover, we're already discovering, is that as these AI uh, ed models start getting embedded into our society that we not only have the same data that we've always had, but we have a lot more data. And so we need to figure out what we're going to do with all that information and how we're going to respond to it. Uh, I don't like students being in trouble for any reason. And uh, the more data that we can accumulate to understand why, uh, I think we're better off as a society. Right. 
So yeah, there's this uh, couple of more comments. I'll just read it out for our information in terms of uh, uh, what the, what our audience is thinking. So one of the comments is uh, one other important point. As a lecturer myself, we are now not the sage on the stage, but rather we are the guide on the site. AI can assist us to become better guides. So absolutely. That's like embracing the technology, right? And co coexisting and adapting to what the changing needs are. And uh, one of our other audience writes that looks like the day is not far when Sophia like humanoids would start teaching. You know, I I had read the story somewhere. This is 2020 or 2021. Georgia Tech had implemented a AI enabled uh, teaching assistant professor. And they Christian that AI enabled tutor as a, um, they call it Simon. And this, so the Simon, Simon would interact with the students, the student would interact and, you know, they would send out questions, they'll get responses and all those kind of things. And till the end of the, at the end of the semester, they said that, you know, we have met all our tutors or our faculties, but we haven't met Simon. Who's, who's Simon? Where, where can we meet him? So they were told that, you know, it's it's an experiment that we did to provide you 24 by 7 support. It's an AI enabled tutor. So that, that story was quite popular for the next six months that the students really could not make out that they are talking to a chatbot, AI enabled virtual bot rather than an actual professor. So, uh, you know, you, you never know, right? You know, it started with someone like Siri with very low emotions and you have to be really precise to get the right answers or she'll be blunt on your face and say that, sorry, I didn't understand you, but I think we have come far away in that particular aspect. So, uh, and and you rightly said, Kim, this is one topic where, where we can, you know, keep on discussing for hours and hours. Yeah, but, you know, it's fun. <laughs> this is where I want to request Paul to come in and, you know, yep. so the innovative work that you are doing at Cognify Learning, Paul, in terms of, mm -hmm building subject-specific AI models. So let's say someone who's new to this entire thing or relatively new to this entire thing, that what exactly AI model means? How do we structure that data? How do we go about doing that? So if you could kind of just walk us through a little bit in terms of how do, what are the building blocks for designing an AI-enabled virtual tutor? Yeah, I, I think that um, first off, I, I like to take you know, with, with me and my team, I like to take a, a very uh, broad approach first and talk about, you know, what the what the purpose of the product is uh, before we get into the details of product design and development. I mean, uh, you, one of the things that we thought about when we were talking to students and presenting this idea to students was, okay, what, what are you what are you looking to get out of this model? And obviously, we talked enough about you know, like the, the 24 seven assistance, the, the tailored approach to learning, and that has never been available before at scale until today. Uh, so that is something that's, you know, the core um, design feature of our product. But one of the things that we're pioneering in, and one of the things that, that is the overall purpose of our product is the, the phenomenon of not being, being afraid to ask a question in a group because you don't want to appear to be the fool. That is something that has plagued the, the world of knowledge since people have even been a thing. And with our, what we understood and what we, what we theorized is that with an AI model that people are very comfortable asking questions to, you break through. For the first time ever, you're able to break through that phenomenon and access a whole new world of, of knowledge that, that students uh, enjoy. And because they don't, they don't feel that they don't, they, they, they feel like any question that they want, any question that they could possibly ask, they can ask to this tutor and is 24 seven and is personalized. That is something that is a benefit to society that I feel like not a lot of people are talking about. So that's the whole purpose of our, of our AI model. Like, uh, so when it comes to like the actual building blocks, the fact is AI is a very big buzzword right now. It's a very big buzzword. A lot of people are talking about it. And sometimes when you go into some of these AI models, they're just, if you, if you look behind the hood, they're just if-then statements. Um, but so the building blocks to providing a very great, truly generative AI model is one, it needs to have some peak prompt engineering behind it. 
Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, prompt engineering is obviously it's a new it's a new um, field, you know, as we know it. So if you're able to really tailor the the personality of the model and it, its learning philosophy to be very effective based on you know what you've learned from from what students would like, that's that's the one uh, is prompt engineering. And also, I mean, you know, the other thing is uh, you know, being able to upload uh, you know pretty pretty. Um, pretty detailed data sets into the model and be able to do that at scale. I mean, a lot of people will be able to do this, but you know, it can cause some hallucina uh, hallucinations in the model. Uh, you know, LLMs are, they're, they're very knowledgeable about a lot of different things, but sometimes they, they could get a few uh, basic things wrong. So that all comes with, with data engineering. So going back to just reiterate, I think the building blocks are, are pretty simple. Have a, have a great purpose for why you're developing this engage in some pretty solid prompt engineering so that you have the personality and you have the expertise and then make sure that you're refining your data sets, Re refine your data sets to where you can eliminate hallucin uh, hallucinations as much as you can. I, I think that if you do that, then you'll have a pretty great uh, virtual tutor behind you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is interesting. And yeah, again, like this is, this is an area where, in, of course, AI is, uh, is a buzzword and after chat GPT-4, I mean, it has just exploded uh, to another level and this is where like you know but i think uh, you very clearly articulated for us is that identifying and defining the purpose as to why we are doing what we want to achieve out of it mm -hmm. and then uh, the second important aspect is prompt engineering i think i was reading somewhere that uh, prompt engineering could be one of the top five highest paying jobs in the coming uh, decade or so and prompt engineering 100%. Prompt engineering is like, you know, the way I look at it is if I have to put it in simpler terms is, you know, in, you know, when our professors used to tell that, you know, if you have to have reasoning abilities or critical thinking abilities in your mindset, you have to ask the right questions. So would it be fair to say mm -hmm. that prompt engineering is more about that, you know, more evolved version of asking the right questions to the model? A hundred percent, Raul, and it is kind of, it's so crazy because when we are developing these models, like for example, when we, when we developed our first model, it was, it was only one class. Now we've scaled up thankfully, but it was only one class and we kind of learned, okay, like let's, let's, uh, you know, let, let's do as much as we can from our, from based on our knowledge of prompt engineering to create this model. But yeah, we, it, it's, we almost had to set aside meetings to, with this AI model to talk with it. And, and really uh, be sure that it knows the task. And even to the point where within, our, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details too much, but we, within our uh, some of our prompts, we even say to the model, take some time to think. Take some time to, to, to look back on, on the answer that you're thinking of generating and make sure that you have all the parameters that we specified uh, in the answer. Make sure, make sure that you, you take some time to do that. And it's so crazy because that is in writing, in the prompt. Uh, and if you look at some of the resources that have been put out by OpenAI and, and, and the developers of Cloud3, uh, Anthropic, they actually have that as a guide to tell the model to take some time, step back, and make sure that the answer you're about to provide is on par with what we've engineered you to do. Um, so yeah, it, just, it takes a lot of training. It takes hours and hours of training. Um, but it's, it's like, it's like talking to a person and it's unbelievable, uh, you know, the, the conversations that, and the meetings that we've had with, with our models, it's, it's, it's really out of this world. No, absolutely. And, and you rightly said that it's a very iterative process. It takes a lot of time. The more data you feed into a model, the more intelligent it becomes. This is the first one telling an AI model, take your time, think through it. I do yeah. not have an instant response. This is the first time that I've heard. So Kim, uh, do you think uh, you're missing um, any of the ingredients, purpose, prompt engineering, data sets? Are those the building blocks? Would you add something to this? Well, it, it, uh, the only comment that I have is I think um, bias goes two ways, right? The machine might generate something that appears to be biased in nature, but what did the human ask it? Was there bias constructed already in the question? And so I think a, a component of our society moving forward is we need to learn how to behave ourselves <laughs> when we interact with the AI uh, if we intend to get information that's um, valid, useful, and meaningful. 
And so I, I think part of uh, my view of a 21st century critical thinker is AI literacy, media literacy, data literacy, and probably some societal literacy. And most of these constructs don't exist yet. I don't know of anybody that's really teaching that stuff uh, in school. And I, I think this is kindergarten stuff at this stage, but we're not seeing it. Right. So uh, I think this is a good time to take uh, some of the questions from our audience. And uh, I think uh, Kim uh, will direct this question to you. Uh, so the question is, how do you think this technology will change pedagogy? Or would it change the pedagogy by any sense? No. Uh, you know, a pedagogical viewpoint, I think, remains the same. What is the intent? We've got to think, re regardless of where we're at in the technology, you got to think about learning objectives. What do you want this individual to walk away knowing, right? Uh, but I think what changes is our expectation of when all of that learning acquisition occurs. We're incredibly uh, uh, curious species. We don't stop thinking at 3 p.m. when school's out and then, well, I, I think we do. <laughs> but, you know, we really shouldn't because our curiosity should drive us almost 24 hours a day. What about this? What about that? We're, we're putting settlements on the moon. We're putting settlements on Mars. Uh, the whole idea of a constrained educational environment goes out the window, but the whole intent of the learning cycle does not. So I, I think pedagogy is still alive and well. It may change characteristics a little bit, but we still need to teach things to people. Uh, that's how we've moved information. It, you know, we, we invented books to start that process. And here we are uh, inventing AI is to make sure that we continue it. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. And I would second your opinion on this. Right. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I think, uh, Paul, we discussed some of this, but uh, do you see uh, as to the role of generative AI or how generative AI can contribute in the next generation AI-enabled virtual tutors or the kind of work that you are doing? Are you leveraging generative AI to a certain extent? Yes, yeah. So I think that obviously it, it's, I, I know we've already kind of mentioned this, but um, it, it's, the whole 24 seven availability and the personalization is key. And the fact that the more we ask these models questions, the more students interact with our models, the better that they're able to learn about these preferences of, of the, of the students at an individual level. And to the fact that we can do something like this is, is still, it still amazes me. And even though, even though we're the one doing it, it's, it's unbelievable. So I think that having that, Again, having that personalization is is extremely critical, uh, and also, you know, it's it's important to note that the ability to scale something like this is still very difficult. Uh, it's and that's that's a problem. Like we can have a uh, an AI model that you know when we present it to to students. So for, for example, a quick side story: like when we presented these models to to our students. We we were doing some some talks at you know different fraternities, different student organizations, and when we showed them what our models can do, they knew that this was an eventuality. They knew that, but when they saw what it can do by providing class specific answers, gentlemen, it was it was like watching a pep rally when when they when they saw like these results. It was, it was unbelievable. So I think that again um, with these course specific AI models, that is a clear eventuality, and. I think that the role that is going to play, you know, in, in the current, uh, you know, the current study environment is you, you do have those three sectors as of right now today, which is lecture, uh, office hours, tutoring, but then you're going to have that, you know, that uh, on-demand 24 seven uh, support. And it's going to be multimodal and hence the generative AI. Like we're going to be able to do it through, through voice, through, through, you know, uh, multiple, multiple mediums. So it's, it's very exciting for the future and, um, yeah, we're, we're excited to be on the forefront of it for sure. Great, great. And uh, I'll request you to take this uh, next question from our audience. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, this could be probably related to the kind of stuff that you're doing, like, you know, you're building this course specific uh, data models. So how do you see curriculum publishers adapting to this, particularly professional learning offered to teachers? Oh boy! Kim, you can share your thoughts. <laughs> oh boy! Tell him, Kim. Tell him, Kim. 
know, do we have a couple hours? Um, <laughs> so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there is bias built into the existing system, right? So textbooks have a viewpoint. It may be subtle. It may be overt. But there's a viewpoint. And you've got textbook publishers out there that are doing sometimes a very good job, sometimes a not very adequate job of keeping the information that they're uh, presenting to the learners up to date. But then more importantly, you also have the academic institution that sometimes they do a great job, sometimes they do a very poor job of keeping those very textbooks up to date. So the whole idea of a textbook being put it on paper has to be thrown out the window. Step one. Step two, the information needs to be more available through an AI, such as Paul is designing, that is available on demand. And so when you're in a situation as a learner and you ask an inquiry that doesn't fall within the constraints of that published uh, document, that it's capable of coming back with a variety of solutions to the question that you're posing. Now, what I just described there is kind of fun. It's having a dialogue with information, right? I have no idea how publishers moving forward are going to be able to make a profit on that concept. No idea. And I think that's why AI in general, a doesn't matter whether it's education or medical or a finance sector, why it is disturbing so many folks that they're fearful of it because it implies a fundamental shift, almost a complete reengineering of the economy in order to support it. So long-winded answer, but I don't think publishing of education materials in the future is going to look anything like we've seen it for the last 200 years, anything. Don't ask me what it looks like. <laughs> I'm trying to dream that up myself. Right, Hopefully and, and if, you, if you don't mind, well, sorry, Kim, if you don't mind me like kind of echoing what you just mentioned, I think um, I haven't really thought about it in, from a publisher standpoint, but it is, I do agree with what you're saying because, you know, for, for our specific models, we need a lot of data to train on. So when we are actually acquiring all this data, it's through, you know, it's, it's influenced by actual course material, but then in order to have some goodwill with the universities, we take that data and have our AI create a, you know, similar uh, data sets compared to, to that actual course uh, information. So what I'm trying to say here is we've seen that our models are, are very, very accurate and very effective at creating their own content that is influenced by, you know, uh, actual human made content, but the content that our AI can make is, is infinite. So when it comes to uh, publishers, that, that is, that is a challenge, but our, our models are designed to just create content upload it to itself, learn from it, and then create better content. So it's an, it's an infinite loop. Uh, so from a publisher perspective, it's very interesting what the future holds for that. Well, and, and one last thing about publishers. So think about a common textbook at a university level. Oftentimes they are mm -hmm. cut into 16 chapters, right? Suspiciously, there's 16 weeks to the semester. And when you start looking at that predefined timeline model and you throw that out the window then suddenly the textbook itself needs to be looked at critically and uh yeah. i'm not sure many of those textbook publishers are quite prepared to completely re-engineer their business model for this emerging environment and i think paul's dead on and it, we've got an environment where a textbook is passe because the system is keeping itself current constantly uh, and, and, and one last thing here, this is where I get really renegade and I'm watching the clock for us. Uh, there is an undercurrent and it's not a popular conversation, but there's an undercurrent of questioning about credentialization. And by that, I mean, does a college professor who's got tenure and got his degree or her degree 40 years ago, still have what it takes to teach that topic on a on a current basis. And the question is, I don't think so. <laughs> That's my opinion. But we we have that whole thing in the background too, right? What gave what made you a king of the universe kind of thing. But anyway. Uh 
Yeah, right. That, 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 I'm sorry, I could go on for hours. <laughs> well, absolutely, and I think uh, I think it to me it just feels like we we've, we've just started the conversation, and you know I can see there's a bunch of questions in the chat box. So that that's the beauty of this uh, transformative technology or the disruptive technology, and education as as educators is so close to our heart that you know we we care for the cause, and that's where these discussions and this thought process are coming in. So to all the audience, like, you know, we really appreciate you participating and actively asking these questions. If for say for, you know, time constraint reasons, if you're not able to answer your question in the live forum today, we'll get back to you via email. We just have a couple of slides, we'll wrap them up and then we'll try and see how many questions we'll, uh, we can quickly take. And of course you'll get a recording of this link so you can take a look at there as well. So basically, just let me reshare my screen once again. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what we are saying is, uh, you know, this kind of trying to summarize that, okay, virtual tutor powered by GPT-4 for accurate, timely, and human-like student guidance. Of course, we discussed and there were questions asked in this particular area, automated learning and teaching and the future of education with uh, AI-based virtual tutor, adaptability, multimodality, accessibility, and scalability. Uh, we also touched upon some of those points. Uh, digital AI avatars for high engagement with interactive and realistic experiences. I think we didn't kind of touch upon that aspect, but primarily it means that, you know, uh, you can leverage AI to build avatars for like, you know, like the metaverse or the parallel universe that they say that, you know, in a hybrid uh, teaching environment, uh, faculty is teaching the students who are present in the classroom but there's a metaverse available there where there's a campus, uh, a virtual campus available there and students who are joined in online. So there's a digital AI based avatar of the professor teaching the students in that particular metaverse. And then student progress, uh, you know, tracking the progress and all, you know, generating insights from the data, making inferences, you know, decision making points and all those kind of things. And uh, before we move to the Q&A, just, just quickly, this power hour was presented to you by Harbinger. Harbinger innovates alongside organizations in the people business, building products and solutions that transform the way people work and learn. We strategically focus on industries like human resources, e-learning, digital publishing, education, and high tech. Founded in the year 1990, more than three decades of experience, a little over 850 plus Harbingers. In this journey, we would have developed 500 plus products for our customers, uh, serviced 400 plus customers. And we take pride in saying that 43% of our workforce is represented by women and 40% of our executive team constitutes of women. So with that, I think uh, we'll quickly open up for uh, the next uh, round of questions. And I think uh, we'll see how many we can take in the next uh, four to five minutes. So. Oh, but by the way, Rahul, I, I, I just dropped my... Uh, I know we have our LinkedIn uh, profiles in the chat, but I also dropped my email just in case. Like, just in case we go over, we could uh, they could ask questions there. Oh, absolutely! Like. And, uh, for the audience, please feel free okay. to reach out to Great Kim. Idea, please feel free to reach out to uh, Kim and Paul if you want to ask any specific questions or you know just to brainstorm and discuss. Uh, definitely. So one of the questions is, what new skills do teachers need to adopt to transition to this new method of teaching and learning? Uh, well, first and foremost, this is my general advice, and once again, in the interest in time, I'll be very brief, but uh, if you don't have a chat GPT or a copilot or similar account, get one, play with it. Ask it uh, thought questions, ask it a variety, ask, ask the AI the same question that you just asked me. Uh, get comfortable with the fact that you have a new companion and you're no longer at this alone. The, the thing I like to tell folks is that don't try to think outside the box because the AI just removed the box. It, all bets are off. You, you can dream up big again. And so go do it. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kim. We'll take another question. How is AI content curated for students whose professors don't quite follow the textbook or whose methods aren't consistent with your training data? 
Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think that that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so the way that our initial training starts is we acquire through um, ideally later down the road it'll be through universities, but we acquire some some uh, information uh, and some feedback from students on because we we have the class data, but then we also inquire our, our you know our students We're like hey you know do you have what do you know about the learning preferences etc. So we have consultations that then flow into our you know, prompt engineering and, and all, even, even into our Python engineering. So we try to get as much data as we can um, about, you know, the, the preferences of, of and, and the dynamics of the class. So that's where we are right now. And then once we have that kind of infinite loop of the AI training itself and the interactions with the, with the students based off of those um, characteristics that we consulted about, then we're able to get close. We're able to get close to, okay, you know, this is some of the insights of the class, et cetera. And we, we imagine getting better and better at that. But um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think with consultations and the right data sets, we're able to get as close as possible to, to uh, you know, what, what the professor would expect in, in a learning experience. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. So I think uh, with that, we have come up to the top of the hour. I want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank our audience. Uh, thank you so much for participating in this discussion, sharing your thoughts and questions and staying with us for 60 odd minutes. Trust me, it's a long time in these days. For 60 minutes, we've got your attention. Thank you so much for sparing that time. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Paul and Kim to take time out from their busy schedules and join us for this conversation. And this is what is you know very special about the education community that we are always willing to give it back to the community, uh, learnings, observations, and thinkings. So once again, Paul and Kim, thank you so very much for uh, you know joining us today for this discussion. My pleasure. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much. Thanks, and uh, everyone will get a recording of this webinar so you can uh, view it later. And uh, yes, we acknowledge there are a few questions which remain unanswered. We will respond back to you, uh, uh, you know, via email on that. Thank you once again and have a great day ahead or a great day evening ahead wherever you are in the world. Thank you.